Um, hello, everyone. Um, two months ago, I think, I asked you if you had any questions to a specialist in theology of the body. And finally, the time has come that we he here have today Dr. Robert McNamara, who is a philosopher at Franciscan University of Steubenville, specializing in St. Thomas, St. Edith Stein, and St. John Paul II and his teachings. This is why Dr. Robert McNamara is also a specialist in theology of, of the body. So, hello, Rob. Hello, Kubert. It's good to be on. Good it's to good to see you, you and it's good to be on your podcast. Good to have you here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, um, thanks for asking me. And I would say I teach the theology of the body, and hopefully someday I'll be a specialist, but I'll do as well as I can with the questions you have. Well, you're the best specialist I have around, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I know that in, in, in American Catholicism, uh, theology of the body is like very popular right now. It's, it's like quite fashionable and, and people know about that stuff. But even though this, this thing is in English, most of my viewers are Polish and quite... Yeah. Paradoxically, it's not so well known in Poland. Okay. So maybe you could tell us a word or two about the basics, like where it comes from and, and how it all started and, and like the basic idea behind it. Yeah, so it's um, teachings of Pope St. John Paul II, originally given as catechesis during Wednesday audiences when he was Holy Father. And he began these catechesis, I think, shortly, uh, maybe a year or so after he was made Holy Father, and he continued for the next four and a half, five years, develop, developing these teachings and delivering them week upon week for the Wednesday audiences that the Pope meets the faithful. Though delivered while he was Holy Father, um, the translator of the work into English, um, Dr. Mikhail Waldstein, and people he worked, discovered that he had written the text throughout the 1970s before he was Holy Father, and was perhaps preparing it for publication when he was elevated to the papacy and had an opportunity to develop to deliver them as these catechises. Um, all in all, they're a reflection on the mystery of being created male and female and the sacrament of marriage. And so he, he journeys through the words of Christ found in the Gospels, the Gospel of St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and also to some degree John. And he journeys back into the Old Testament through the lens of Christ and the directive of Christ found in those Gospels and begins to unfold what it means to be created as a human person in the image of God, male and female. And having developed that theology of the body or embodiment as male and female, he then proceeds in the second part of the work to, you could say, apply this to the sacrament of marriage, understanding marriage as a reality of grace and as a sign, a sign of grace and a sign of Christ's love for the church. And then he concludes at the very end with something like the practical significance of the theology of the body, how it's worked out in the marital union with reference ultimately to the question of contraception. And the question of contraception indeed gives us the key to why he wrote the work, because um, as you and your viewers are I'm sure aware in the 60s, Pope Paul VI, St. Paul VI published an encyclical Humanae Vitae, where he asserted again perennial church, church teaching that contraception was not licit for the use in the conjugal act of conjugal union. And of course, this encyclical dropped like a, um, a bomb within the church itself and within society more at large. And there was great dissent to what was taught by the church in this encyclical. And in the encyclical, Pope Paul VI asked theologians and priests and other, other faithful to reflect upon church teaching in this area. And it seems to me that Bishop Wojtyla took this very seriously at the time, having already written a book on human sexuality, love and responsibility, and he performed a biblical reflection upon the meaning of gender, and he entered it to some degree from his philosophical perspective as a personalist, and develops then the theology of the body out of this ground. Okay, so um, this channel mostly um, concentrates on symbolism and hierarchies and patterns etc right okay. and well the basic symbolic structure in the basic symbolic structure we have a division between the the masculine and the feminine which is like black and white like two two opposites or two like 
two completely separate things. But humans are not fully like that. We are not we are not archetypes in the sense that hyper like like every woman is a is an incarnation of the feminine and every man is the full incarnation of the masculine right in the sense that we differ extremely so how how would we how could we uh make sense of the fact that we're all human so we're all in this one family of being human beings but then we are separate separated kind kind of into those two yeah types <laughs> yeah yeah so um the symbolism of masculine and feminine or the symbol and symbolism of the male and female human person is not something i've looked closely at but at the same time when thinking that together with the theology of the body there's maybe a natural point of entry into it so i mentioned when when we discussed the theology of body and overview how um, having developed the theology of the body in the first part of the work, um, developing the human person created as male and female, in the second part of the work, we look upon the sacrament of marriage. And it's together with the sacrament of marriage that we find a more fulsome development of the meaning of masculinity and femininity. And of course, as Catholics, we understand sacraments as efficacious signs, signs that, um, um, that communicate grace, and signs whereby we can, in some or other way, depending on which sacrament it is, come into contact with the God who loves us. And so, of course, then the sacrament of marriage is, is an unusual kind of sacrament because it, it takes a natural reality, marriage, based upon the gender difference of humanity. And it takes that natural covenantal union, that natural personal union, and raises it to a dignity of the sacrament, having healed and purified the, the marriage of, of the consequences of the fall, then we have an elevation of marriage to become a sacrament, one of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. And therefore, sign is something um, essential to marriage. And the structure of the sacramental sign bears reference to the human person as male and female. And so there's a certain way in which symbolism is immediately found there together. Of course, a sign is not merely a symbol, but signs include a symbolic character, a symbolic value, a symbolic aspect or dimension. So um, one of the sacraments then of the Catholic faith has this sign character. And, and what kind of sign is it? It's a sign that communicates the love of God to the couple and then to all of those in the community of the couple. The, the love of God in a way becomes a real living part of the couple's lives in and through the sacrament of marriage just like the love of God becomes a real and living part of an individual's life who is baptized and, and strives to live in the state of grace. So um, when we think then of the symbolic value of, of masculinity and femininity, of being male and being female, we can see that it's, it's showing us something of the love of God. It's, it's an earthly symbol, more strongly an earthly sign of the love of God. Um, a medium whereby his grace becomes real in a, in a very important human relationship, the relationship of the couple, then also in the relationship of the community of the family, and also the relationships of the extended family, etc. Now, marriage is, is, um, has, has another dimension that is of great significance that comes across to us in the letter to the Ephesians. That is that the, the marriage of a baptized couple is a sign of the love of Christ for the church. So St. Paul puts before us in, in chapter five, the letter to the Ephesians, that the union of Christ and the church is to be understood in a marital way, that our marriages here afford a signification of Christ's love for the church. And there's a kind of analogy then between earthly marriage and this heavenly marriage, which is ultimately completed in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so, Again, that, that signifying um, of divine love is, is bearing reference to marriage and thereby bearing reference to the creation of the human person, male and female. Now, if we were to sort of pare that down and, and understand it in, in a couple of sentences, um, marriage is a natural institution 
and then also in a higher way as a sacramental institution affords for us a sign of the love of God. How does God love us? God loves us not only with a fatherly love, but also with a spousal love. And what kind of love is this? It's a love that is um, total self-gift. And we see this total self-gift in the person of Christ. He became man in the incarnation and then lived amongst us and was prepared to die on the cross for us, us collectively and each of us individually. So he has given himself wholly in his body for us. And the marriage of individual couples signify for the couple and those around them this, this total and faithful love of Christ. Christ says, all of me for all of you. And the, the married couple says, all of me for all of you. And in this way, um, afford a, a concrete manifestation of the love of Christ. Now, that was more than two sentences, that summary, but we get a sense. Okay, but... Um does it mean that that our sex gets it gets its meaning in a, a marital relationship only or do we carry it with us throughout yeah. our whole lives yeah I, i would say the meaning of sexuality of sex, of, of gender, if we want to think of those as synonymous or distinctive, maybe we can talk, talk about that later. But the meaningfulness of it, I think, is most readily understandable from the perspective of the spousal union, the union of man and woman, and then also their union with their children as parents. And so we get, we get most light cast on the meaning of, of sexuality from marriage and family. And indeed, the the generative capacity of sexuality, its procreative ability, it seems to me, is that which casts the most light. Um, we, when, and, and maybe we can think these two things together. Um, what, what does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? Well, if it makes me capable of marriage, it means to be able to give myself to this one other for life. This one other who is the same in humanity as me, but opposite in sexuality. And then when we have given ourselves to one another in this way, it capacitates us as a unit, the spousal union, to give of ourselves for the sake of new life, for the sake of our children, and for the sake of their flourishing. So there's a, there's a twofold gift bound up with sexuality here, mm -hmm. a gift of self to another for the course of life, another of the opposite sex, and then together with that other, a common gift of themselves to their children first by bestowing life upon a child or children, and then by giving themselves over to the formation of those children, helping them to grow to the full stature of humanity. And so I think when we look at it from the perspective of a couple's relationship towards their children, we really see the meaningfulness of sexuality. You have, you have kids, Kuba. I, I recently um, have become a father of, of three, and um, I, I'm, I'm beginning to recognize In, in a certain way where all of this theory is grounding down for me. Myself and my wife have to, together as a, as a, as a communion, um, serve the life of our children. And this, this incorporates us in a very precious kind of union. Why? Because we're working out the formation of other human persons, other individuals destined for the presence of God. And for some strange purpose, God has thought that we're able to take this responsibility. It seems to me... If I was the creator, I, I wouldn't be given new immortal beings into the hand of frail humans or, or um, and, and, and not only frail, but sinful. So um, this is a certain respect in which we're learning our spousal union in relation to our children. Our relationship to our children of self-giving is, is teaching us how to be one. And so um, when we look at the meaning of sexuality from the perspective of, of the child, we see it forges a kind of union between the spouses, which union was already there to begin the life of the child, but now is forged in a new and deeper way. Mm -hmm. Now, if we step back from, from both of these meaningfulnesses, well, what is the meaningfulness of sexuality from the perspective of the Aja body? Self-giving love of spouses to one another and then together towards the children. And what does self-giving love effect? It affects union, the union of spouses and the union of, their sp of the spouses together with their children, the familial union. 
So then what's the meaning of sex union? Yeah. And then when we think of this as a symbol or sign of the divine love of humanity, what is God attempting to teach us? He's striving to teach us that he loves us in such a way that he wants to become one with us. And he has given of himself in the person of Jesus Christ, wholly and completely so that he can be one with us, or more precisely stated, so we can be one with him. And then our role in life is to learn to return that self-gift. And marriage helps us to learn that process, I think. Marriage is one of those privileged places, marriage and family, where we work out how we are to give ourselves to another. Because as well, you know, this is a husband, we, we fall far short of it. The self-giving that's involved in marriage is just is so immense that, yeah, my, my own frailty and sinfulness, sinfulness constantly frustrates my ability to do so. But I learn slowly. Yeah, well, um, what I'm trying to aim at is um, quite recently I, I watched uh, Matt Frad's interview with Dr. Alex Plato, your colleague. Yeah, he's next office actually. He's just <laughs> right to left here. <laughs> you can wave at. I can, I can see if he's there and bring him in if you want. <laughs> no, <'cause, laughs> they were they were addressing the issue that the, the, that the popular sentence now like trans women are women or something like that or that someone feels like a woman. And and he said that that he needs to understand what this woman means. And then also Matt Walsh at Dr. Phil, I don't know if you saw that, uh, was also asking a question like, what does it mean to be a woman? Yeah. Like, what's, what is a woman? Yeah. And I, I'm wondering if, if like a good definition here could be something in, in terms of, of relational definition, like a woman is a wife of a husband <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah that 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 it fully like you you fully get what is a woman only in in relationship to 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 the other right yeah i, I wonder if we could go this way yeah some of what you're speaking of reminds me of certain sections of the theology of the body particularly the early chapters where the relationship of adam and eve is put before us as a paradigmatic kind of, of human relationship, of a male-female relationship. And there the Holy Father lays out that Adam discovers what it means to be human in his relation to all of creation before the face of God. And Adam discovers his, um, his meaning of being human and a male human with the appearance of Eve. And so we have that great phrase, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There's a certain respect in which Adam discovers what and who he is with the appearance of Eve. And this then is a delightful discovery, not only the discovery of Eve, but in some way the meaning of his own humanity, the meaning of his own humanity specified as male, as the complementary opposite of her female humanity. And so um, let's let's approach that for a moment because it's it's worth bringing into play. Earlier, you spoke about the fact that well, male and female both human, and yet as male and female, characteristically different as human. And it seems to me, it's really important to recognize that that we're human persons to begin with, and we share the entirety of what it means to be a human person with the opposite sex. We have all of the same faculties. We have the same body soul structure. We're destined for the same kind of perfection of virtue and the love that is holiness and entry to the presence of God. So there's, there's much more that unites us in humanity than that um, distinguishes us as, male, as male and female. Upon the foundation of this unity in humanity, then we have the duality of sex. And this duality is a kind of difference, but a difference that's not... Um, it's not oppositional, rather a difference that's complementary. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, we, if we were to understand this difference with respect to its complementarity, then we see it has to be understood relationally. Um, by hypothesis, if there was only men in the world, we wouldn't really understand what it means to be male as human. If there were only women in the world, likewise. And simply looking at our bodies would reveal this, yeah. And also we'd have no generative possibility. We wouldn't be able to create other men. We'd all die out in one generation. Yeah. So there is a very real sense, in fact, rigorous, essential, necessary, that we understand these uh, in a relational way. 
So <laughs> um, it is a, a little bit postmodern, right? Like meaning of one word depending on the meaning of the other. Yeah. And the, the relational meaning rather than independent. Yeah. I wonder if, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway. in, in, in as much as God has, has created it as simply a duality, mm -hmm. um, though the, the relational meaning comes about in and through the duality of humanity, it has this foundation in humanity and it really does bear reference to one another in a sort of determinate way, not, not a postmodern, postmodernist interpret it as any way you want way. Now, this is why I said earlier that you, you have most light cast upon sexuality when you understand it as generative or procreative. Why? Because only the male and female coming together can generate new life, can procreate their child in cooperation with God the Creator. And we see the, the meaningfulness of this differential complementarity with reference to the child. And then both man and woman are necessary in the beginning of the child and for the sake of, of a good formation of that child in the full stature of humanity. So um, there are really referential points to this relation that show it's, a, it's got, a, it's got a, a clearly determined outline, I think. Okay, so, so we are human, but we are uh, distinct in a way that we are male and female. But there are many different, many other distinctions like thin and fat or um, tall and, and short, right? Skin color or anything. But these are um, kind of meaningless faced with the, the, the difference in sexuality, right? Yeah. Um, the meaning of sexuality seems to highlight itself for our consciousness whenever we experience ourselves or encounter another human person so maybe something as simple as when, when i'm walking down the street when i come across another human person the first thing i'm interested in determining about them and when i describe them to someone later is is their sex is their gender determination um this is this is i become conscious they're a person and then i become conscious of what kind of person male or female they are and there's some way in which this conditions everything else I come to know about them. And um, if we can't clearly see whether it's a man or a woman, it, we kind of, we're kind of um, ill at ease until we've, until we've sorted it out, until we've, until we've figured it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to be something foundational. Um, it seems to condition other aspects of being a human person. Right. Um, if we look at this with respect to the theology of the body and, and with respect to the, what this is teaching us, well, um, God created us as male and female, and that has great significance for us. It's not a. It's not. Um, it's not without significance to the creature, or it's not without divine significance. Indeed, Plato and Aristotle. Um, recognized the divine character of generativity. Um, and you could think of it like this, even though you and I as individuals or any other animal or any other living being will die, if we generate, this, the species continues with a kind of quasi-endlessness. Mm -hmm. And something that's endlessness, that's endless is, is something like eternity. And eternity is something of God. And so there's something divine-like about sexuality very clearly revealed to us in generativity and procreativity. Mm -hmm. um, so um, God made us male and female, and that's really significant. And when we become conscious of it in our experience of ourselves and one another, it bears significance for us. We're recognizing something of that defines sig significance. Now, if you think about, well, what is that significance? Well, God wants to reveal his love to us. He reveals it fully in Jesus Christ, and sacramental marriage stands in reality, and indeed, to some degree, natural marriage as a signpost indicating for us the love of God. Um, like um, some, sometimes we find signposts outside of us whereby we see the love of God. Like we see a, a, a saintly soul, we see a saintly act, and that indicates to us a kind of divine love and we come to learn and know God through that. But marriage is really, really close to each of us. 
or indeed sexuality is really, really close to each of us. And to the certain way in which the sign value is inscribed in our nature, it's inscribed in our nature as male and female. When this nature is lived out in marriage and family, that sign is flourishing in the world. And what's the sign of? Well, God loves us. God, God loves humanity. Christ loves the church and wants union with the church and all of its members. And so um, coming out from the perspective of God, then it's something like this. Um, God so much wanted us to know of his love for us that he inscribed it in our human nature. And he inscribed it more precisely in, in sex difference and complementarity in the union that's possible from that and in the life-giving potential that's that's possible from within that union. And it's really, really close to us. Like when a husband loves his wife, he's saying, I love you and God loves you. When a father loves his child, he's saying, I love you and God loves you. And he's not doing these as two separate acts. It's just one and the same act. It's just, I love you. And at the same time, that's sacramentally, God loves you. Um, and yeah, that, that seems to me something of, of the meaningfulness of sexuality and why it bears this kind of significance for us. And then why, um, why, yeah, why, why I suppose it can become so problematic for us as well, so difficult for us. Okay, so um, do we have a reason why it's precisely two? Like God, God is a trinity and I don't think we can say that that the Holy Spirit is like a child of, of the other two. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the, historically in the Western theological tradition, so I'm, I'm first a philosopher, but I, I do have an interest in theological subjects and, and sometimes teach theological subjects, including theology of the body. But I'm um, sort of briefly looking over the history of this, sometimes the the image of man and woman and child or, or family is put before us as a kind of image of the Trinity. Now, um, this is worked out closely by some theologians. And there's a new book out by Dr. Wallstein, whom I mentioned to you before, who translated the theology body into English called Glory of the Logos in the Flesh. And so for resources towards understanding that, I, I would refer people to that text. Mm -hmm. um, Augustine and St. Thomas are, are very careful with that kind of imagery um, um, because it can be so perhaps so grossly misunderstood. What is very clearly put before us in sacred scripture and what comes to the foreground in the theology of the body is, is not simply the Trinitarian communion of love, but the communion of love that's been established by Jesus Christ in the incarnation and in his passion, death and resurrection. And it's that communion of love that St. Paul puts before us in the letter to the Ephesians. And so it seems to me that this is our first reference, our first divine reference of the meaning of human sexuality. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the incarnation came forth from the Trinitarian love, from the love within God. The second person became man as, as Trinitarian love, you could say, expressed into created reality. And so ultimately it will it will teach us about, about the love of God, not merely towards us, but the love of God as such. But for further resource than that, since I'm not really proficient in it, I'd, I'd send you to that, that book, Glory of the Logos of the Flesh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe right. other writings of Dr. Wallstein. Now, um, so... So I think yeah. in that book, Wallstein would show the scope of the, the question and, and give a subtle answer to the question whatever that answer is yeah and you have to the text to see yeah I'm, I'm i'm trying to pinpoint here some somewhat the like the extent to which we differ as uh two sexes like our basic body structure is the same like we have two two arms two legs if you're healthy etc right the, the basic yeah formula for a human being is the same but then down to every cell in your body or almost every cell in your body you are a male and a female right and there's there's also some well documented research in terms of the psychic abilities or psych psychology that 
we are the same in in i don't know 90 percent of the stuff but there are those fringes where where we differ and 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 men are more prone into some things and women are more prone into something else and i wonder about keep wondering about spirituality um because yeah as you say you fully realize your sexuality in uh, in them in the in the union of the two right but like for example uh, nuns and friars do they have different spiritualities because they're male and female or is it just yeah. human spirituality that we should yeah. follow okay so yeah and this relates back to a question you asked earlier that i didn't didn't actually answer i recall now um it's easiest to see the meaningfulness of sexuality from the perspective of a marriage and family, because that's that's you could say that towards which sexuality is naturally ordered and then sacramentally ordered. If someone should enter the union of marriage and ha have a family, but um, of course, it's not restricted to that domain as the only domain in which it's significant. It bears reference, I think, to all of human life. Um, in some way, I'm a, I'm a man, a male human person in all of my interactions, whatever they be. And this is, um, it seems to me, the conditioning impact of sexuality upon the whole of the human person, character and personality. Mm -hmm. It really has an import that runs right through us. All of our, you know, bodily structure, all of our emotional life, all of our deeper psychological life and indeed to the point of our spiritual life. I don't think we're determined as male and female spiritually, but I do think that in as much as um, we're, we're a unity, it has real spiritual import, um, whether I live as a man or whether I live as a woman, whether I've been determined in this way as male or female. And it has import in all of my human relationships in every way I interact with people. Um, now, what significance is that? Well, it seems to me that in some way, a man carries his potential to be a husband and a father into society and into social interactions. And a woman too carries her potential to be a wife and mother into society and into social interactions. And that, that's important. And we, we have often throughout history and even in the recent past, um, attempts to sort of show how that's significant like the interests of men seem to be different than the interests of women psychological studies show this um some of that interest seems to be men seem to be interested in structure and women seem to be interested in person and I, i've done a bit of thinking about that and it seems to me that it couldn't be true to say that it's a contrast of person and structure why because persons are way more significant than structures it's persons that are going to endure to eternity and live in the presence of God, not structures. So it wouldn't seem right to me that half of the human, human population is about persons, the most important thing, and the other half just about structures. So I think it's more something like um, because a woman is capable of being mother, she's this ability to attend to the development of the individual with a kind of focused cherishing and thereby foster the development of the individual person. Mm -hmm. And a man, in contrast, has an ability to, to attend to the structures that surround that person, the natural context of that person, again, for the development of the person to maturity. So our gaze is turned towards different things, both of which I think are incredibly significant for the development of persons, the development of children, the couple's children, but also the development of other persons. So maybe parenthood, most abstractly understood, could be something like this. We help another person to attain maturity. That's what parents do for their actual children. But do we not do that also for one another in society? Do we not always help one another to become more fully ourselves? And in that way, are we not in a way co-parenting one another throughout life? Well, then your maleness, your masculinity is going to have an import upon that. Or your femaleness, your femininity is going to have an import upon that. How that takes shape in different people, depending on their character, their temperaments, their personality, that'll be a really, yeah, a really interesting collage of differences. But there will be something motherly about the woman's parenting, co-parenting, and there'll be something fatherly about the man's co-parenting, it seems to me. So it, it, it answers the question of infertility in some people, like, you cannot say that, that you're not a woman or you're not a man <clears throat> if you're infertile. Yeah, um, 
or can you, because, because yeah. you don't no, realize no. your yeah. potential as a mother no and, and this, this will help us answer the question of like the religious the consecrated religious uh, nun or, or monk or, or priest um or even the single person you know what's the meaningfulness of sexuality for for these people or as you said they're the, the person who's barren or the couple who's barren who can't conceive or can't bear a child um bodily parenthood is ordered to spiritual parenthood so the human person is a um a spirit material composite or a soul body composite and therefore the body and its development will be important and the spirit and its development will be important and indeed more important. And so bodily parenthood in the human species is ultimately ordered towards spiritual parenthood. Now we can see this straight away when like, we wouldn't call you much of a father if you just generated the child and then went away, stepped away from the woman and the child. Why? Because well, you haven't helped that child attain their maturity, first of all bodily, but then also inner spiritual maturity, the ability to grow in virtue, the ability to understand the world truly, the ability to become wise and prudent. This is all something that has to be bestowed upon the child. And this is spiritual parenthood. So everything that goes into formation and education, we could call spiritual parenthood. And that's ultimately what parenthood is about. Bodily parenthood is a prerequisite for it, but it's completed only in spiritual parenthood. And we see that when we go, if a man steps back and doesn't take responsibility for the maturation of this child, we would barely call him father. We'd call him an absent father. Mm -hmm. So of course, then a couple that's barren, um, someone who is single, someone who is consecrated themselves to a religious community, to the church, to Jesus Christ, all of these can exercise spiritual parenthood. And in this realize their parental capacity. Um, of course, the natural course of things is bodily parenthood together with spiritual parenthood. But since spiritual parenthood is the ultimate meaningfulness, you can forego bodily parenthood for the sake of spiritual parenthood. And if you do so, then your parenthood becomes more expansive. So you're a father of four boys. I'm a father of two girls and a boy. And maybe you, you, you as a couple will have more, maybe we'll have more, but there'll be a restricted domain of our fatherhood. Whereas if you had become a monk or a priest or I had, we'd be less intensively involved with a small number of people, but we'd be much more expansively involved in a larger number of people. And perhaps at some of those even more intensely. Like when I think of my own spiritual director, um, and I think it's a better term even to, to use, speak of them as spiritual fathers, he has been a father to me in, in such a significant way that there's a real fatherhood operative in him. And... I think, yeah, um, our sexuality bears reference also to that in a very defined way. So this this just came to my mind. Sorry if, if I'll shock you with that, but let's try to map this to the Holy Family. How like okay. the, the motherhood and the fatherhood of, of Mary and Joseph. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose in the motherhood of, of the Blessed Virgin, um, Jesus Christ, who, who grew to who grew in stature and wisdom, had had a had an encompassing, loving, cherishing um, environment, and in the fatherhood of, of Saint Joseph. He had someone who, who secured that environment and provided for that environment and structured life so that that environment was made possible for the, for the Blessed Virgin and the Child Jesus. And um, then, yeah, I'm sure that the scriptures are very um, sparse on St. Joseph's interaction with the child. I'm sure had a significant role in his in his in his childhood and in his growth i mean the the, the thing is that you know he oh there is a Joseph secret father. there is a secret that he he is he is the father and he's not the father right at the same time and yeah. um yeah. just oh yeah yeah now i see where you're, you're getting at um well of course 
in as much as Jesus Christ was born, um, was conceived supernaturally and, and born out of that, then the Father within the Trinity is the Father. Um, and of course, this was announced to the Blessed Virgin via the angel Gabriel, and she's considered a spouse of the Holy Spirit. Um, so there's a certain respect in which, um, yeah, Mary is a spouse of God, and God, as God, is the father of, of Jesus Christ, the person incarnate. Um, but at the same time, Joseph had a, had a real fatherly role in his life often called foster father, um, so as to definitively place God the Father as the Father, and therefore definitively put before us Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as God incarnate. But um, when we think of this qualifier, we ought not to think of it as a diminution of the role of St. Joseph in the life of the, the Holy Family, in the life of him as husband with his wife, the Blessed Virgin, and them as parents of the child Jesus. Um, there's an authentic fatherly character to Joseph's presence in the Holy Family. And I think we'd, we'd have to go as far as to say he's the true paradigm of the earthly father, even though he did not give bodily life to the child Jesus, even though this was brought about by supernatural intervention through the announcement of the Archangel Gabriel. So, so it, it really blows my mind and it keeps like bogging me. <laughs> yeah. This is the model of, of, of family and this is the model of fatherhood. And this father is, you know, and, and, and Mary is, is, is like perpetual virgin. And, and, and yeah. this, is the, this is the model family of, of a monk and a nun, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a certain respect, I suppose you could say that they've, they've born both vocations in themselves, mm -hmm. the vocation of, of husband and wife, um, and with that father and mother, and the vocation of being holy gods. And that's ultimately what consecration or virginity for the sake of the kingdom means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean in a reductive sense, simply not having sexual intercourse or not having had sexual intercourse, but rather it means being holy gods, being set apart for God. And the Blessed Virgin and St. Joseph were set apart wholly for God and as such came together as the mother and father of the child Jesus. So I, I, I think perhaps you could say there's a certain respect in which they bore vo both vocations in themselves. That makes sense, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, and I think it's then well to think of St. Joseph as a, authentically a father, even mm -hmm. though he was not the bodily father of, of the child Jesus, but that was God the Father. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, and then of course we can take him as the paradigm of father, of, of fatherhood. Nice. Um, so yeah. one viewer asked if, like, if if masturbation doesn't lead to, I well probably he 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 had some um, scientific research in mind. I'm not sure he didn't disclose that. But um, if, if it doesn't lead to addiction in the teenage years and it doesn't uh, negatively influence the, the marital life later on, why should it be yeah. wrong? Yeah, so I suppose maybe one would question both of those ifs. Um, but I, I, I'd rather approach from another angle first and then maybe return to those, those two hypotheticals. If, as we've developed it here, with reference to the theology of the body and, and, and our conversation that sexuality has a significance and that significance is not minor but major, and that is a relational significance, that like my masculinity orders me with respect to my possible future wife, and then when I'm married, my wife. And then together with her, my, my masculinity orders toward me, my, my father out of, of my children. Then there's something inherently relational about my masculinity. 
you could say my masculinity is not my masculinity it's my order towards my wife and together our order towards our children now masturbation seems to short circuit that order instead of sexuality being about the other my wife it becomes about myself sexual instead of our um, common sexuality being about our children as mother and father it becomes about ourselves individually individualistically and so it seems to invert the order of sexuality instead of leaving it outwardly focused it returns it to oneself and it's a kind of self-centered or selfish inversion of the order of sexuality this then can become addicting and um, is often associated with the use of pornography which has its own um, badness bound up with it mm -hmm. and um, then causes difficulty in future relationships in terms of uh, dissatisfaction and the inability to be satisfied sexuality and then of course these differences these difficulties will flow outward towards the children and towards community more broadly if we become selfish in an area that's meant to be so altruistic as sexuality it'll have really passed on our personalities mm -hmm. now at the same time um uh, we recognize that this is something that's taught widely in our culture and young people are inducted into it often before they become critically aware that this is a real problem fortunately within the catholic dispensation we have the ability to attend to a priest in the sacrament of reconciliation and bring before him this or any other sinfulness and seek the grace and mercy of god in that area of our lives and real healing is proper is um, is possible here um yeah the, the healing offered us in the person of christ is runs really deep into our character into our personality and in an area so significant as human sexuality, in as much as it bears reference to marriage and family, the healing that's possible in this area, I, I believe, is, is deeply, deeply impactful upon life. It's a profound healing that's possible. And if we persevere to um, live our sexuality in these unself-centered ways, then God will bless us with, with that possibility. You, you don't have to live within the within the shame of it, of, of the use of pornography and masturbation endlessly or for the rest of life. Thank you. And I think this is it. <laughs> That's all the questions I had. Okay, and great. Yeah, I think you well, like opened up, opened up a few windows in my head that, that will continue to... Um, let in some fresh air and, and some fresh thoughts maybe and yeah thanks well, so much the discussion too, ben. It's, yeah, it's been great seeing you again it's good to, good to connect like this yeah and I'm proud I, I got you before Matt could do it <laughs> <laughs> he lives across the street from me so maybe sooner or later I'll wander into his podcast well he mentions you more and more often so you know <laughs> he probably wishes to he, he sends you signals <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Okay, Cuba. Yeah, thank you. thank you very much and good night, everyone, or goodbye whenever you're watching this. <laughs> See you. <laughs>